Welcome to the Equip Podcast. Here you'll find conversations from people of all different walks of life, sharing their experiences, the things the Lord has taught them, and things to equip you. Equip is based on Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, that talks about equipping God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. That is our goal here, to build you up and equip you through seasons of ups and downs in life. I've got a big mouth, but it's not that big. Hi, gals. How is everybody tonight? Woo-woo! It is so cool. I wish I had my phone up here with me so I could, like, pano what's going on. It is amazing that the Lord has brought this many women together for such a time as this. And you know that if he has, then he's got big plans, right? I've got a couple of props over here. Is this kind of annoying a little bit? Are y'all okay? You see me on this side? But I would like to start tonight, before we get going, I would like to know if I have any other friends in the audience that I have not seen in 10 years so that I don't have another heart attack or two. If you're here and you know me from college or high school or something, will you just throw your hand up and let's get it over with. I've had a couple of friends that I have not seen in years just walk over to my table and they're like, hey, I'm like, what are you doing? And so I feel so distracted. It's like I almost left and went to Starbucks uh, so we could catch up. But we're going to get going tonight. And I want you to know that tonight's talk with me is very different than what we're going to do in the morning. In the morning, we're going to do something extremely intimate. You're going to be getting so much information from so many people. I will tell you, if you hear something from me that you've heard somewhere else, I hope you'll cue in and realize God's trying to tell you something. But we're going to do a pretty informal talk tonight in the regard that it's going to be extremely practical. Now, I will have people complain. They're like, oh, she talks so fast. Debbie will say, they want blanks. And I'm like, I hate blanks because I forget them. And also what I'm just going to say is buckle up, buttercup, because they only gave me 40 minutes and I had to pare down my notes and pare down my notes. But I feel very strongly that the Lord has given us a couple of practical things to think about because, you know, we have an enemy of our souls that wants to steal our joy. And the problem with him, he's stinking sneaky. And he flies under the radar. And the other thing about him is he is not out to just shock us. He's playing the long game. So he's trying to come in in ways that where we're not thinking about it, where we're not prepared. And before you know it, we've been walking this way and all of a sudden we're going this way. Because that's how that goes. So before we get started, I would love to show you a little bit of what I've got going on when I'm not here. They asked me at the podcast, they said, what brings you joy right now? And I said, let me think for a minute. Family reproduction. (laughs) Gary and I have four beautiful kids and they are now producing children and we are nuts about them. So this is our oldest daughter and that's Gage and Hudson with Gary and I. Then I've got another group. This is my little Brit brat. This is Brittany and her husband. And there's my only little granddaughter right there. That's Holland and Walker and Beckham. And there's T-Man, my son, my only boy and his wife Taylor. And they just had a baby a few weeks ago and that's Lawson. And then this is my baby. This is Valley Taylor and her husband, Trent. And we've got Clay and Dodger and the twins. And that's Breck and Brody. Now, I've got to tell you, this last one, we've had all boys except for Holland. And so she's been wrangling all these boys. But just a few months ago, something happened. We found out we're having another girl, and we're so excited. The look on her face just says it all. So we're preparing for Sunday. They're going to call her Sunny, and so we're super excited to meet little Sunny in July. So, But anyway, I just wanted to show you a little bit of my family. I'm up on a stage right now, but I'm no different than any of you. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're all doing life. We're all trying to figure it out. We're all trying to hear from the Lord. So we're going to see if my, my nickname and my grandmother name is Gabby. So you'll hear me refer to myself as Gabby a lot. So what we're going to see is if Gabby can stay with her notes and if we can get something done here. So tonight, (laughs) 
we're going to start with asking the Lord for something very, 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 very specific. When I was studying through the message last year, I took the challenge from the Lord to read through the entire Bible. And I decided to read it in that translation just because it reads more like a book. And I just kind of wanted to follow along that way. So anyway, I'm going through it and I came across a very familiar story that I've known for a long time. And it's embedded in 1 Kings 3 and kind of carries on to 4. But Solomon was what we all consider and what the scripture says was what the wisest men to ever live. And what was really interesting about Solomon is the Lord came to him and said, ask me for anything you want. And I want you to know the scripture says anything. Okay. So when you start thinking about it, what would we ask for? If somebody said anything you want, we'd probably say riches. We'd probably say a baby. We might say a family. Some of the other things that I'd written down here, is that we might ask for health. There's a lot of things we might ask for, but if you know this story, what did he ask for? Wisdom. When I did my research and I started looking at what wisdom is, it says wisdom isn't mere information or theoretical knowledge. Knowledge for knowledge's sake means nothing. Wisdom is the practical ability to separate right from wrong And then to act upon it. You know, we have a real problem sometimes of knowing a lot, but not doing a lot. Okay? And so what I began to see, though, that was so beautiful, when I read through this translation my whole life, I've read that Solomon asked for wisdom. And the message is written as, Solomon asked for a God-listening heart. And the ability to to discern between good and evil. Doesn't that just get you? I said, oh, Lord, I remember tearing when I read it. I said, God, I want a God-listening heart. Like, I want to be able to hear that. But in 1 Kings 4.29, it tells what God's response was. And it is just stunning to me. It says, then God answered Solomon. He gave him wisdom. The deepest of understanding and the largest of hearts. There was nothing beyond him and nothing he could not handle. And I was just like, okay, now we're getting somewhere. That's what I want, Lord. I want a God listening heart. I want you to give me the ability to cope and to handle things and be able to stretch myself. And so tonight, as we get started, can we bow our heads and ask the Lord to give us a God-listening heart so that he can talk to each one of you personally? My guess is, is through this talk, there'll be some things that resonate, there'll be some things that want, but I bet you anything, the Lord's got something specific to say to you. So let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this time to be with these beautiful women. God, I truly do wish that they had the same seat I have right now where they could see what this room looks like filled with women who've come to hear from you. God, as I say every time I go to speak, God, there's not one woman in here that needs to hear from me, but every woman in here needs to hear from you. So I ask that you would bless our time together, Lord, that you would just articulate my ideas and my thoughts in such a way that they'll be palatable, Lord, and that they will desire um, to follow through on the things they've learned. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, the scripture that I have listed, if you're following along in the workbook, it starts out 1 Peter 1, 6 through 9. It's in the ESV, and it says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy. And this is the part that I loved and why I picked it, that is inexpressible. And then it goes on to say, and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So if you're going to fill in some blanks, 
Tonight, we're going to be talking about killers and fillers of joy. Some important facts that we need to know now. That's one of your blanks. In order to experience joy in real time. And to do that, we've got to combine two things. That's truth and strategy. When Debbie and I had lunch and we were kind of talking about the conference and, you know, we were just praying about what will resonate, what will be, and and we both agreed, there's so much of the time that we're talking to women and, you know, you've heard it all. It's like, I've been to church, I've been in the Bible studies, but there's nothing changing in my life. It's like I come, I go, I put that one on the shelf and it's like, I hear it, I know what you're telling me to do, but I don't know how to do it. I cannot figure out how to make it a reality, how to implement it in such a way that it's affecting my life and the lives of those around me in real time. And so tonight, like I said, this is just the most simplistic message maybe I've ever done in my life. But I'm praying that you're going to leave here with something you can apply and take um, take it up with the Lord. So... The other thing that I want to tell you before we get started is as we go through these things and as we walk through some of the things the Lord is teaching us, I want you to know that my focus is not behavior modification, okay? It's heart transformation. Too much of the time we come into situations like this and we're like, okay, if I just can do A, B, C, then I'll be a good Bible study girl, And Debbie will make me head of the committee. And the pastor will think I'm a great person because I've been here and I've been there. And at the end of the day, you can only keep that standard for so long. So that's not what we're talking about. Because when you let God get in your heart and you let him begin to transform those things inside of you, behavior just becomes what it is. It follows through with your heart. And so I just want you to know that when you're seeing these things and thinking about these things, and we're talking about this throughout the whole weekend, I want you to think heart transformation, heart transformation. This is not a to-do list to make me good. These are things that I can apply to my life that can maybe help me get out of a pit when the enemy comes after me. So we're going to fill in a few more blanks before we start talking about the killers and fillers, because we're going to start with this, because this is the truth. These are some facts that we know from scripture about joy. The first blank is joy is available. I heard Debbie talk about this in her little vignette when she began. Psalm 1611 says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And then Psalm 139.7 says that God is always with me. I will not be shaken for he is right beside me. So when the enemy tries to tell you you're all alone, you know, God's not by you because you've been sinning. You know, he's not with you anymore because you took a left turn, right turn, backwards turn. That's just not true. Because if you tap into his presence... He's right there. And it says, Eugene Peterson said this in when I was studying last year. This was in the the Bible and kind of the comments. It says, anyone who gets in touch with God gets in touch with joy. All true joy is a derivative. It doesn't originate from the world. It doesn't originate from us. It originates from him. And when we get close to him, it rubs off. Now think about the people you know that are joyful people. It's true, isn't it? But with, but whenever we get a little deeper into this, we're going to tackle that a little harder. But the second blank is joy is a gift. Now think about when you accept Jesus Christ into your heart, you are given the Holy Spirit, that gift of the Holy Spirit. And with that comes the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But it's almost like when you're given a gift, I I think about a funny story about my mother-in-law. And uh, when I spoke here in 2019, she was sitting right here on that front row and we've lost her since then. But this was such a funny story about her. She had really, really bad arthritis. 
And so we, she loved to bake, though, and she loved to make Gary chocolate chip cookies. He's kind of her favorite, and she didn't make any bones about it. So when we would come into town from Dallas, she would get those cookies going. Well, it got to where her arthritis was, was so bad, she couldn't hardly mix them. And she'd wait till Gary would get there, and she'd get him to mix cookies for her. And so Gary and I said, you know what? Let's get her a KitchenAid. Let's just do that for her and get her one of those mixers. She can just throw the stuff in there, mix everything up. And uh, so we got it for her, and she opened it. She was like, oh, you guys did not have to do that. You shouldn't have done this. And we were like, no, we want to do it for you. Well, about three weeks later, I came back, and that thing was sitting in the box on the counter. And I said, Lightning, did you not like your mixer? She goes, oh, honey, I love it. And I was like, okay. I said, bull, why hadn't you opened it? Well... I just don't know if I'm going to know what to do with it when I get it open. And she had let fear keep her from tapping in, opening this gift, and allowing it to become a blessing to her. And I thought so much of the time, that's the way we are. The Holy Spirit, that's weird. I don't know about that. You know, I don't know. I'm not a very nice person. I'm surely don't have kindness and goodness and all these things in me. And we just sort of like poo-poo it. And we forget that that is a gift that God's given it to us to tap into. Another, gift, another blank we're going to do is joy is our heritage. And it says in Psalm 119.11, your testimonies are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. You know what I thought about when I read that? Do you remember in the Old West? I have a friend that came from the Old West, from Tahoka tonight. Rebecca's in the house. But let me tell you, back in the day when they were claiming this land, they would go and they would stick something down and they literally would claim it. And they would say, this is mine. And I started immediately, the Lord began to tell me, the problem with our heritage with the Lord is that, and this is what I wrote down in my journal, we claim the trouble instead of claiming the promise. When we get around people and they say, how are you doing? They're saying, I just can't hardly take it. And y'all, and if I'm talking about something, I probably, Lord's probably already whipped my hiney with it, okay? So, um, but I can be the world's worst about that. Well, what do you do? Oh my gosh, it's just so stressful at the store. Oh my goodness, you know, I've got all these things to do. I'm so busy, you know, and we just start claiming all the things that are tough, And the Lord taught me a lot, and I wrote an excerpt about this in my book, 24 Karat Life, about the difference between proclamations and explanations. And a lot of the time, we spend so much time trying to explain what God might be doing in our circumstances. You know, we're just claiming the issues, and then we're trying to basically make it make sense to us. And so you might say something like, well, you know, this and such happened, but I'm sure God, you know, he's probably trying to teach me to do this or trying to show me this, or he's probably going to get her because she shouldn't have done that. And that's probably why this is all going on. And at the end of the day, you know what that does? That does not drag people to want to know more about God. That basically shows your lack of faith that he's working. And I began to realize the key in those situations is a proclamation. Because let's say that you tell me something and you confide in me and you say, hey, you know, this is going on. And then I say, well, gosh, what do you think is going to happen? And you would say, I don't know, but I know God is good. I don't know, but his word says that he is faithful. Do you see the difference in that? That not only gives you a lift, but it makes the person around you go, huh. Because people don't want to hear your complaining. People do want to hear my complaining. I feel pretty sure of that. (laughs) My husband loves it. Like, he just lives for it. (laughs) But it's the truth. And as believers, we should be doing things and handling things different. So I want you to think about that when the enemy comes in and you feel this need to throw up all the things you're disappointed about. Answer truthfully. It's okay. It's okay to talk about things. But be able to back it up with a proclamation, though, that you know that God is moving. The other one is, and I think I heard, Debbie, I was back in the other room, but joy is a weapon. And I loved that when I realized that. It says, Nehemiah 8.10, do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And you know, 
I have this written in my notes. I'm going to kind of read. It says, most joyful people fight to rejoice. Now, I want you to hear that again. Most joyful people fight to rejoice. And if you think about it, the people who have inspired us the most are people who have walked through fiery trials. Because what? They have street cred, right? And I thought about the fact that we as women, we either set set ourselves up to become a victim to our circumstances or a victor despite them. And the enemy always is going victim, victim, victim. And it's just insane. And the Lord is like, you tap into me and I'm going to give you that inexplicable joy. Because this is what I do know to be true. And I wrote this in my journal. Joy in the enemy cannot rule in the same place. So you kind of have to decide who's going to rule. Is it going to be joy? Or is it going to be lies from the enemy? One of the last blanks we're going to fill in really quick is joy is medicine. Proverbs 17, says, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. When I read that, the first thing I thought about was how crazy we are in these days and times of what we decide medicine is in our lives. Medicine is Instagram instead of God's word. Medicine is alcohol instead of meditation. Medicine is diet pills instead of self-control. We're just taking all these drugs that are not good for us because we're too lazy. And I, and I don't know, hold on, hold on, hold on. There are people that have serious issues. I'm talking about if God has gotten on you about it. And I guess I'm speaking personally. I can be extremely lazy when it comes to picking my medicine because I pick the thing that's easiest. I pick the thing that costs me the least. And I picked always take the easy way out unless I'm allowing the Lord to change my heart. But this is the problem. The deeper we get into things that we self-medicate with, the more the addiction forms and the harder it is to get away from it. I could sit here and probably have each one of you, if I gave you the mic, I'd say, what are you doing to self-medicate? What are you doing? What are you doing? It's all kinds of stuff. It's not just a few things I named. But I started thinking about when we're talking about joy, this is the deal. We're not talking about the kind of joy where you go, okay, I'm going to pull myself up by the bootstraps today. I'm going to be happy. My life sucks, but you know what? I'm going to be happy. And then you look at yourself in the mirror and you go, you're happy. You're happy. Don't you feel happy today? That's what the world will tell you to do. Look at yourself and tell yourself you're happy, self. But at the end of the day, Christian joy is completely different. Because it's not an emotion on top of emotion, a feeling on top of a feeling. It is an emotion and a feeling on top of truth, the truth of God's word. You can depend on that. That's a totally different kind of thing. And so that's why getting in the word and knowing the word, because if you don't know the truth and you're not learning it in such a way that, that, that you can just pull it up, then it becomes of no good to you. But we have to look at it like that. When we are joyful, The way we're going to stay there and the way it's going to actually manifest itself in our life is we're building it on the truth of God, not on a cute Instagram post. And I love Pinterest. I could be on there all day long and there's all kinds of stuff. But let me tell you, you can get sucked into that. And before you know it, it's not really the whole truth. It's part of the truth. And that's why we get so off track. I've said this before, but it's just coming to my mind. So I'm going to say it again. The Lord must be bringing it to me. That whole thing of she believed she could, so she did. Well, let me just tell you something. When you're successful in things, it's because God does it in and through you. So that becomes a very independent thought wave if you're not careful, but if you don't understand the truth of God's word, it's hard to be able to tell a lie. 
And like I said, Satan's way of coming at you, if he just walked up to you and just slapped you across the face, you'd probably go, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. He doesn't. He does that just little bit, little bit, little bit. So that is why we're going for truth and strategy. And I just really began to realize that the strategies can seem pretty obvious because we talk about prayer, talk about being in Bible study, we talk about being in church, being around other people. And so I was like, God, but you know, I feel like those are the obvious things or the things we always talk about. So that's when I began to realize that there were several that were coming to the top. And so that's what we're going to tackle really quick. And we're going to start with the first joy killer. And it's that you're too full of it to get filled. Okay. You're too full of it to get filled. Let me take my, do y'all love my box? Do y'all ever get things and you just love them? I have a whole uh, ministry thing coming out on the Glue Network soon. It's called Living Bright and Beautiful. So I am so about the colors right now. It is coming at a wonderful time. I'm like, okay, all these 80s colors coming back. But the best way I know how to explain this is, oh, I, don't, I don't really want to read my notes, so I'm just going to go with it. Whenever we get in a conference like this, and I am so aware that you come and you're on a high, okay? And then you're standing here and you're saying, Lord, just fill me up. I want more of you. God, I just fill me with your love, with your spirit, with all these things. And he's saying, I'd like to, but you're already full of a bunch of other stuff. And so I decided since I like sparkly things, I was going to try to do it like this. <laughs> See all these diamonds in this jar? Okay. Well, let's say that I've been collecting these diamonds for a while, okay? And they may not be special to you, but they're special to me because my kids gave me some of these diamonds. My husband gave me one of these diamonds. And they might be fake, but it's a sentiment that counts. And I love them. And I mean, I filled my whole jar up with these things. But let's say you here on the front row, you come to me and you go, hey, Leanne, those are fake diamonds. And I'm like, I don't care. I love them. They shine and they sparkle. And she says, but I want you to know, I've got a whole cup full of real diamonds. The real deal. She said, but at the end of the day, you're going to have to pour out your diamonds so I can put the real diamonds in there. And I'm like... Well, wait a minute. That sounds kind of good. But I need to think about this for a second. Because if I pour these out, then I won't have them anymore. And she's like, but Leanne, I have the thing that's actually valuable. Ladies, I feel like that is what God is trying to tell us. We're holding on to things in our heart. And these are some of the things that the Holy Spirit had me write when I was preparing. We're so full of bitterness. We're hanging on to people that God has set low. We're hanging on to ideas. We're hanging on to mindsets. We're hanging on to fears. We're hanging on to hurts. We're hanging on to addictions. And the Lord is just saying, you are being selfish and you're being lazy. Because you're not giving me full control. You're not emptying out the bad stuff. Believe me, you know, we kind of fell into the whole thing you don't have because you don't ask. But at the end of the day, there's another side of this that comes in that we forget about. If you only give God this much access, that's about how much access you're going to have of what he has to offer. And there's a difference in being transparent with God and being vulnerable. And that's with God or with other people. Transparency, I'm transparent up here right now. You can see me, right? But let's say it's like being in a bubble, and I'm standing here in a bubble right now. You can still see me, but the vulnerable is when you pop the bubble, and I let you into that space. And as women, the enemy will say, don't do that. She'll judge you. Don't do that, because you know what? They'll never, ever think you're a credible witness to Jesus again. And the weird thing is, is we also transfer that with the, to our relationship with the Lord. 
We're like, you know, we don't feel like we can be vulnerable with him because we're afraid he's going to take something from us that we don't want him to take. But you have to understand that at the end of the day, God wants to give you the very best. In fact, the way that the Lord kind of showed it to me is, Leanne, I want to give you the very thing you would ask for if you only knew what I knew. You know, and so it's just allowing ourselves to get rid of the junk. So one of my strategies and the strategies I'm going to share with you tonight are things that I have done myself and they have literally ushered in so much joy, so much freedom, so much time with the Lord to do real work. And I, the diamonds have been coming in, but you know what I do? I will sit there and if I'm going to get with the Lord, I'll get out a piece of paper or a journal or something and I'll say, God, okay, start telling me. What am I full of that's not you or of you? And I'll just start writing things down, and I'll just write one thing down, write another thing down, write another thing down. And it's what's so interesting is sometimes I'll see a pattern evolve. And so that's what I encourage you guys to do. After you're gone from the conference, say, Lord, I do want to be full of you, so what do I need to get rid of? And when you start doing that, sometimes you'll see a pattern. What I had written in my stuff is sometimes you'll see a pattern of you need control. That's what you can't let go of is control. Or it might be that you have an identity problem. You know, it might be that you have an anger problem, bitterness problem. You know, I don't know. For each of you, it'll probably be something different. But then once I figure out what that pattern is, I'll get on Google and I'll start looking up scriptures about anger or scriptures about whatever. And I will literally go in and write them all down. And I, that's where I'll begin my study in my time with the Lord because I let the truth of what those things say because you have to change your mindset. You have to understand because we're not talking about behavior modification. We're talking about heart transformation and some things are hard to let go of. If you've been bitter for a long time, especially if you've had a family member hurt you, that stuff does not go away easy. But God's like, as long as you hang on to that, you are choosing not to have the fullness that I want to offer you. And so I just really encourage you to take some time and do that. Because when we empty ourselves of those mindsets, we make so much more room for him. The second joy killer is a head full of dread. And this one is, mm, I think the enemy loves to suck the joy out of us by dreading to do something. And that can manifest itself into things like, this is going to be so hard. I don't know how I'm going to do this. Or that seems impossible. And that turns into things like, um, I dread going to work. Oh, okay. I thought it was my mic. I dread going to work. I dread having to cook dinner. These are just some things I wrote. I dread having to do chemo. I dread having to be around this family member. I dread, I dread, I dread. And it constantly shows up. And you know, if you've been around the Christian world at all, everybody has jumped on trying to explain what happens in our heads. And it's truth, what they're telling us. And they talked about ruts. Ruts. Well, I've started calling them death ditches. Because mine are so deeply embedded. I'm like, oh my gosh, Lord, you know, I am just such a stinker. You know, it is so hard for me sometimes for you to change my mind about stuff. But I've just begun to really realize that when you allow this head full of dread to come in, two things are happening, okay, that the evil one is trying to convince you of. Number one, that it's all on you to fix it. And number two is that you start to begin to believe that God isn't big enough to walk you through it. And both are terrible for not only your morale, but your heart, your mind. And um, I've been memorizing scripture, and my word for this year is now. And the scripture that I attach to it, which I, excuse me, which I hope you'll write down, is Matthew 6, 34. It's one of the best scriptures you'll ever have regarding dread, because this is what it says. Give your full attention to what I'm doing right now. Don't get worked up 
about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard thing comes up when the time comes. Now, the minute it said don't get worked up, I was like, ooh, you know, this is for me, for sure, because I can get worked up pretty easy. But at the end of the day, you know what the other special piece of that is? God will help you deal with whatever these problems are. As women, we do not want to deal with things. We want to sweep them under the rug. Another thing, we want to wish them away. We isolate. We get lost in the disappointment. But God is saying, I want you to deal with it. I had an issue that the Lord told me to deal with in January. And I put it off until April. Okay? Now, for somebody else, it might not be sin. At one time for me, it wasn't necessarily sin. But for me right now, it's sin. And the Lord said, I want you to get rid of your credit card. I want you to give it to Gary because you're spending more than you need to spend. It's just, I'm just being vulnerable in this moment. It was like, you need to honor him. And you know what I did instead? I hung on to that darn thing. I said, well, I'm going to think about it, Lord. Because I might need something. And I may rather ask for forgiveness than permission. (laughs) And Gary didn't take it from me. It wasn't a situation like that, but the Lord told me, I want you to show some self-control in these areas. And so finally, the Lord kept, you know, telling me, you know, you need to do this. You need to do this. And I finally handed the darn thing over. But let me tell you, All the way through, God's like, so when are you going to do it? So when are you going to do it? And you know what I did? I felt guilty. I worried. I would just stress about it. And you know what came down to why I wouldn't give it? It's like, well, he ought to have to do something too. (laughs) He's not perfect. Darn close. I love him with all my heart, but I kept going, well, he's not doing this and such for me, Lord. And when he does that for me, I'll put this right over here. And finally, the beginning of this month, as I, sorry, as I literally prepared my heart to have an ounce of authenticity in front of you, the Lord said, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to do it and you're going to do it today. And you can ask my husband, I came in and I was bawling. And I said, God's been telling me to do this for a long time. Will you forgive me? Because I haven't. And I want you to know I want to honor you in this. And I'm going to give it to you. But you know what happened? Joy. There was crying that night. Because I was really worried I wasn't going to be able to get those shoes I wanted. (laughs) But, 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 but there was joy in the morning. The next morning I got up and I cannot tell you how the Holy Spirit just infused me with joy because I had been obedient And because I had put what he asked me to do over what I preferred to do. And so much of the time, that's what we're doing. We have a head full of dread. We dread doing this, dread doing that. God's just like, just kick your bell shoes off and do it. So I encourage you, if the Lord is speaking to you about something specific, you want to usher joy in real quick, get obedient. And watch and see what he does. Another filler that I kind of had hooked to this, and I'm going to tell a story, and I pray you guys will still love me when I'm done. Because it's kind of graphic, but it's the truth. You need a good friend who will tell you the truth when you can't see it for yourself anymore. And I'm going to tell a story. I have two friends that I have met since I've been in Tyler. Debbie and I have been friends for a long time, and I adore her. And she is a thousand percent. And I've had added two new ones that are just extra special. And when we get together, we can talk about truthful things, but we don't let each other stay in the ditch. You know, when I'm going through something hard, I don't need somebody to go, well, you know what? I'd be ticked off too. Girl, you deserve to be mad. Like, that does not help me at all. I need somebody to say, well, 
that kind of stinks. I don't blame you for being upset, but look, what would God want you to do in this? So, you know, you can't do this. So you need a friend like that. And I got to thinking about this story. When I was having Valley, my youngest, I was in the hospital, okay? And I had a super easy birth with Tyler, so I was not prepared for pain, okay? I got into the hospital, got the epidural when I was at a two, hadn't even felt a contraction yet. I pushed five times, he popped out, and I was like, well, what's the big deal about having a baby? This is no big deal. But when I had Valley, I was at a seven by the time I got to the hospital, they could barely get the, I was like walking to the hospital room and I was like, get that epidural in me as fast as you can. Like, just get it, get it, get it. But we get in there and I'm experiencing all this pressure, okay, that I didn't feel when I had Tyler. And it was disturbing because I could not figure out what that was. And so I'm laying on the bed and the nurses kind of turn me on my side and the tears are starting to come because I'm like, this doesn't feel right. I think something's wrong. Now, the nurse is fully aware. She's done this before, okay? So she's fully aware of what's going on. But I pull her close to me, like where I could whisper in her ear because I was so embarrassed. But I said, ma'am, I need you to go lift up this sheet and tell me which area this baby's coming out of. And I swear, y'all, she looked at me, she goes, what? (laughs) And I said, ma'am, I'm so sorry, but I am really concerned because I know where it's supposed to be coming out, but it feels like it's coming out of somewhere else. (laughs) And she's like, oh, honey. She goes, no. I said, I need you to look. I need you to look. And so that sweet thing went down there and lifted up that sheet, comes back around to me, says, everything's fine. Everything's coming out where it's supposed to come out. We're going to be fine. But you know why the Lord brought that story to my mind? Is I was out of my mind, okay? I was so scared. I was so scared it was going to hurt. Like, I did not know what to do with myself. You need a friend that you can go to That it doesn't matter if you're out of your mind. It doesn't matter if it does not make sense. One of the cool things that Margie and Hickson talked about in the marriage class that really resonated with me was that you don't get to decide somebody's pain, whether it's real pain or not real pain. And we have a really bad habit as women of judging. And we'll say, well, my gosh, it's not that big a deal. She just needs to get over it. But for the person that's walking through it, they could be not as mature in their faith or whatever. But you need somebody who loves you enough to go down there and look and then come back up and say, you're going to be okay. And this is what we're going to do. But I thought... We, the devil wants us to isolate. He wants us to isolate. And it is the worst thing that can happen. And so I want you to really, really think about that, that find a friend, just one friend. You know, I have some friends that we just text scripture back and forth to each other every day just to show what we're learning and what that looks like. But be intentional about making that type of friend way up at the top of your list. Okay. One of the other things kind of in regard to this before we go to the last one is you have to set your gaze You know, you find people that will speak truth into you and kind of bring you down off the ledge. But you also have to purposefully set your gaze on things that are what the scripture says, uh, true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable. If there is any excellence or anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And sometimes you have to literally train your brain to stop, to recognize that this is not a thought you're supposed to be having. Does that make sense? So anyway, so you're going to go through here and you're going to say, okay, um, I agree with this. I don't agree with this. See what I'm saying? Like if the bad thought comes, my friend Kara said that she'll literally say it out loud. You know what? You're never going to be able to do that. I do not agree with that. She says, sometimes I'll just say it right out loud. I do not agree with that. And then when something good comes and she feels like the Lord's giving her truth, she'll say, I agree with that. 
And so it's become a really cool strategy. The last one, and we're going to go through this one really quick because I've got something fun to share with you guys, is we lose perspective, okay? We lose perspective on things like uh, we think we own the plan. And so we're basically trying to get God to work our plan, and that's instant loss of joy because Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans for a future and a hope. But it starts out with, I have a plan. And so it's submitting to that. Number two is a joy killer is we decide what looks good. Proverbs 16, 2 says that men and humans basically are satisfied with what looks good, but God probes for what is good. And there's sometimes when we might see a good thing, but it's not God's best. So he's saying, I want you to wait on that. But we get grumpy and we get tired of that, you know, but at the end of the day, it's submitting to that. And the third one is we use measuring sticks as path indicators in our life. And let me explain this. We think that mindset of, well, if I can just get here, then I'll be happy. And that has killed me at times. Things like, um, if I could just get that house, if I could just get that job, if I could just have that baby, if I could just get healed, if I could just get my husband to love me, if I can just get that child to get their life together, then I'll be happy. But the Lord says, Your ways, and in fact, it's Isaiah 55, your ways are not my ways, nor is mine yours. And then it goes on to say, in a different translation, I don't think the way you think, and I don't do it the way you do it. And I was like, well, dang, Lord, you have to yell. Like, okay. So in those instances, you have to tackle it with asking the Lord to help you with your unbelief. In Mark 9, there was a man that came to the Lord, and he said, um, I need you to heal my son. And, he, and Jesus says, do you believe that I can do what you've asked? And you know what he said? He said, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. Y'all, for years, I read that and I was like, I'm sorry, that just does not make sense. That's confusing to me. I believe. Help me with my unbelief. But isn't that where we are at all times? I'm thinking about you talking about, hey, you know, I feel all these emotions. And so what I've learned to do is when I feel myself doubting and it's beginning to steal my joy, I literally say, Lord, help me with my unbelief. Because he says, you don't uh, have because you don't ask. And when you do ask, you ask for wrong, with wrong motives. But that's a good motive. I can promise you, you can ask that and he's going to come. So the last thing that I kind of wanted to do, and I'm skipping some stuff because we're running out of time, is I want to show you a clip that I hope will bring home what I'm here to do tonight. Because it doesn't matter what Debbie does, what I do, what you learn, you're going to have to choose to implement. So I'm here to tell you I'm crazy Barbie, okay? And you're believer Barbie, okay? And so I'm going to give you two choices too. You can wear this cute high heel. If you're a high heel girl, you can step into joy in this little baby. Or if you're a little tree huggery and you like your sandals, you can step in that way. But I'm like crazy Barbie. I don't want to give you a choice. It grieves me to think of you walking out and choosing to stay the same, choosing not to let God deal with the things, okay? So now what I'd like for you to do is I know that some of you in here are, you know, there could be a lot of people in here that are not believers, that are just have never given Jesus Christ even a try because you've burned out on religion and it's not not ever made sense to you. But I want you to know, if you have Jesus, you have it all. But the problem is, is if you don't have Jesus, you really don't have anything. All the things that you're grasping to and hanging on to are going to be things that just dissipate and leave. Do you see what happened? They were grief-stricken and chose to follow Jesus. And then what happened? The joy followed. So as we close right now, the worship team's coming up. If you're a prayer person and a coordinator, would you guys kind of put yourself where people can find you and see you? Because I am fully aware that there could be somebody in who's never not choosing joy because they've never even chose Jesus. And I want you guys to feel like you can find, they're all in white shirts, correct? Okay. So anywhere in this place that you see 
someone with the white shirt, while they're doing worship, you sure can go down and pray. But as the worship team comes up, I want to just speak this declaration over you that I wrote about six years ago. And it says, when we completely surrender our lives to God, we choose joy. God starts changing our hearts. And as our hearts begin to change, so do our minds. And when, we, and when he starts changing our minds, he starts changing our interests. And when he starts changing our interests, he starts changing our priorities. And when our priorities change, our, availabil- our availability changes. And when our availability changes, our togetherness increases. And when our togetherness increases, stuff starts to get accomplished people's lives get changed and when even just one life gets changed the ripple effect begins then families get changed churches get changed communities get changed cities get changed states get changed and countries get changed all because of him Thanks for listening to the Equip Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to be the first to know when a new episode drops. And follow us on social media to stay connected. We're at GABC underscore women. See you next time.